So I'm going to talk about the Valinda formula. But for Higgs bundles. And so just uh, first of all, before I go any further, I would like to stress that this is joint work with uh, Sergei Gukov and Dupay, who's here. And I also want to just somehow remind you of the classical Valinda formula for those youngsters who maybe weren't around when the Valinda formula was a hot thing. So, uh, and then I, that allows me to set up some notation. So G is going to be a simple and simply connected reductive algebraic group. And I'm going to consider a sigma. This is going to be a complex, smooth, algebraic curve. And then I'm going to take M to be the moduli space of semi-stable holomorphic G bundles on sigma. And finally, uh, L, can you see down here? Yeah. yeah, L is going to be the determinant line bundle, bundle on M, okay. And now the theorem, which is sort of the algebraic geometry version of the Valinda formula, because it isn't exactly in this formulation that Valinda conjectured it, but the theorem is due to Senes, Donaldson, uh, Bertram, and Senes, Los Galapagos and Wentworth, then uh, Thaddeus, then uh, Bouville, Laszlo, then Kumar, Narasimhan, and Ramanathan, then Pulley, then Faltings, and then Tilleman, and Tilleman Woodward. So really, you know, there were many different cases that was covered at various different times in history, and I tried to sort of put them in, I think, the order in which it occurred. And now the theorem says that dimension of this finite dimensional vector space that I get by taking uh, an integer power of L and looking at holomorphic sections globally over M, so K is here a natural number, uh, is given by the sum of F in F rec rho divided by W of theta of f to the one minus g. Let me tell you what the right-hand side of this equation is. So t is going to be the Lie algebra of t, where t inside g is the maximal torus. And of course, I want this guy here to be the Lie algebra of g. And then I want T reg to be consisting of the regular elements in T. 
uh, R is going to be the set of roots of G, and R plus is the positive roots inside R. So this is positive roots. Let's see, we need rho, which is the half, the sum of the positive roots, like this. We need uh, theta, which is the highest root, and we need to normalize a bilinear pairing on the Lie algebra, such that the norm squared, oh, so this is just the killing form, so let me write killing form. And we need it in such a way that the norm squared of theta is two. Okay. Excuse me? Uh, it's capital T rec. That's the regular elements in T, meaning the ones who stabilize us, the center. The regular element. So there's a unique maximal torus through these, whereas the complement, there's more than one maximal torus that goes through them. So the, the centralizer in the group is larger than the minimal possible. Okay, now I'm going to look at the following map. T, I, T, we have the exponential map to T to the torus. And I look at the induced map, chi, here, uh, which is obtained by considering the following map on the Lie algebras. You know, uh, I, sorry, this is the dual map. This is the dual guy. So if I apply it to some element over here and I apply it to eta, this is k plus h. k is from up there. Ah, there was a little mistake in this very smart move. You should have asked me to move these. Can you see the top blackboard? Okay. So this is just applying this bilinear pairing like this, but you scale it like that, where H is equal to the dual Coxeter number. Okay? So I get an induced chi by the commutativity of this diagram. Now I define f to be the kernel of chi, and I define uh, f rho to be chi inverse of e to the two pi i rho inside t, and I define f regular sub rho to be f rho intersected with the regular elements in the torus, and now I consider the vial denominator, so product over the positive roots, and then two sine i alpha over two, like this, and I have theta of f is equal to delta of f squared divided by the size of f for any f in t. So you see that now I've defined everything on the right. G is the genus of the curve. Sorry, I forgot to write that. So this is a very beautiful way of writing it, which is sort of really general in Lie theoretic terms. Okay, and you can find this formula, in fact, in Tillemann's work. Very good. So now, uh, yeah, I should maybe just mention that a number of the proofs of this by far not all of them, but a number of them relate this space to the space of conformal blocks. And then Toshio Ueno Yamada proved that the space of conformal blocks is given by the Valinda formula. And it is in fact in, the, in conformal field theory that Valinda made his conjecture. Okay, so it's just the restating. I don't want to write all the stuff about conformal blocks and so on. We are not going to use it in this talk. Okay. So now, on to the Higgs bundle case. So I'm going to consider 
MH, this is going to be the moduli space of semi-stable holomorphic G Higgs bundles. And so it's really perfect organization by the organizers because all of these terms have just been introduced in the previous two talks. So I can just go. And I'm going to let L also denote it by L. So the same letter, I'm sorry, but this is smart. This is the determinant line bundle over this moduli space. Okay. Now, this moduli space, as we've seen, has the C star action where you just scale the Higgs field by scalars. And so there is a C star action on M. H, which lifts to L. Okay, so that means that if I now consider um, H zero of M H L to the K, where K is again a non-negative non integer, well, this is an infinite dimensional vector space. And so one could say, what does the Verlinde formula mean for Higgs bundles? Well, the thing is that if you now decompose this space according to the C star action, so I'm going to write that as a sum, n equals zero to infinity, and then h zero n, m h l to the k, which means that in this block here, the C star action is the nth tensor power of the standard representation of C star on C. So these all become finite dimensional. And so because these are all finite dimensional, I can now define what we like to call the Hitchin character. And it is simply just take some formal parameter t and define dimension t of h0 m hix l to the k to be the sum n equals zero to infinity, then take the usual dimension of the nth guy, and then take t to the n. So just the generating series for these numbers here. And so the Verlinde formula is going to be a formula for that generating function. Okay, so little note. Note that if G is strictly bigger than two, or if G is two, and the rank of G is greater than or equal to two, then the cotangent bundle of M, the guy I have up there, is uh, open and dense, with co-dimension at least two, and therefore I can restrict to the cotangent bundle and I lose nothing, and these pieces here can be given a very natural description when I do this, because then I simply just get that H zero N M H L to the K is H zero over M, and then you take the nth symmetric product of the tangent space to TM cross L to the K. So that's exactly the nth eigenspace under this action. Okay. And so what I'm going to do now is write down our Valinda formula. Oops. Can you still see the full board up, up top? Okay. So, um, the formula, so the theorem, is the following. And so this theorem is due to, in first us, well, simultaneously with Halpern Leistner. And it says the following, 
So I'm going to gradually improve the versions that of, this state, of this statement. But for now, I just make some very safe assumptions. G is going to be bigger than one. And all K in the natural numbers. John? Yeah. This last formula there, what's the L on the right hand side? Uh, L? Oh, not on that one. The last thing you wrote is. The last thing I wrote, dual Coxeter number. <laughs> you wrote this long time. L to the K. Yeah, which L? You're on M now? Yeah, the thing is, I used the same letter for L uh, downstairs and upstairs. And that's because the bundle you get upstairs is just pulling back via the, canar via the cotangent bundle for vibration extending. So that's why I used the L for both things. Slightly confusing, I'm sorry, but because they're related so closely, it's, I thought it's okay. Okay, so uh, dimension T of H0, H, sorry, MH, L to the K is simply given as sum running through, you take F rec rho, but you T deform it. You still divide by the vial group, and you t-deform the quantity that you're taking. But else the formula remains exactly the same. So now, what is, now I owe you definitions of that. Let me do that here. So, first you t-deform uh, chi. So chi t is chi multiplied by the following quantity. It's the product over the positive roots. And then it is one minus t e to the alpha divided by one minus t e to the minus alpha to the alpha. Think of that as a map from t to t star. Now take f rho t to be chi t inverse of the same guy, e to the two pi i, the vial vector. Inside T, it turns out that the cardinality set of this is exactly the same as when T is zero. And when T is zero, you have chi. So the cardinality set doesn't change if T is very small in some neighborhood of zero, zero to epsilon. Just a remark for now. Now you take F regular rho T to be the same kind of thing, you take rho t, and you only take the guys who are regular. And now comes the formula for theta t. Theta t is the following. One minus t to the rank of the group, one over the size of f that remains the same. And then you have product over alpha in the root space, one minus e to the alpha, one minus t e to the alpha, divided by the determinant of the endomorphism associated to the Hessian of the following function. So h dagger t is the endo, so endomorphism of t uh, 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 obtained, <laughs> using the inner, the pairing, and uh, from the Hessian of the following function, dt of xi is a half times k plus h times just the very simple quadratic part coming from the pairing, minus trace in the Lie algebra of the dilogarithm of T e to the xi plus rho xi. So that should tell you what these quantities are. Okay, so let me maybe just do an example. So let me show you what this gives for SL2C. So for SL2C, you will find that F regular rho T divided by the vial group is equal to the following set. F is equal to E to the I phi 
phi runs in the interval from zero to pi, and it solves the following equation. 2i, k plus two, two is the dual Coxeter number, right? Phi, and then you've got one minus t e to the minus two i phi, divided by one minus t e to the two i phi. Squared is equal to one. So this guy here. Notice that if t is zero, you're just looking at e to the two i k plus two phi is equal to one. And so the solutions you know, are the usual one. j pi divided by k plus two, where j runs from, <laughs> Uh, I'll go through that in a second, sorry. Theta t, in this case here, of e to the i phi, this is going to be one minus t sine phi squared, absolute value of one minus t e to the two i phi squared, divided by k plus two over two plus two t, and then cos 2 phi minus t, absolute value of 1 minus t e to the 2 i phi squared. So that's the quantity you have to sum as an explicit function of t. Uh, yeah, so, so in other words, well, let, let's just see that this here recovers the old Valinda formula. So if I take t equals to zero, what do I get? Well, then I get, let's see if I can fit it in here. So f regular rho zero divided by the vial group. This is the f is equal to e to the i phi, such that phi is, as I said before, right? Look at, this is gone, and you just have that, and therefore you just get the solutions j pi over k plus two where j runs from one up to k plus one. And if I take t equal to zero here, all of this drops out, all of that drops out, and I just see this usual quotient applied to that. So therefore, indeed, I get the usual formula that says h zero m l to the k is just k plus two over two to the g minus one, so I've taken that term outside the sum because it's common to all of them. And then k, let's see, sorry, plus one, I think it is. Yes, and then sine squared j pi over k plus two squared. So that's the usual guy. So it's a, yep. What do you mean by t dual? Do you I didn't say t dual. T star means the dual torus. So I guess in, so nowadays we have to say the Langlands dual torus, but in the old day you would say just take the dual lattice and the dual vector space and divide those two by each other. Okay. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the, uh, uh, the theorem. Maybe I can just try, let's see, how's, how are we doing for time? Uh, bad. So... Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I should write just a few lines about the proof of this. Uh, so the proof is really, uh, the proof is really that uh, in the philosophy of Tillemann, and it owes a lot to Tillemann and many of his collaborations. So, um, but the first thing that you do is the following, that if G is bigger, so let me just say one, two, three, four, or something, G, if G is bigger than one, what happens is that h zero of m h l to the k, so over the moduli space, this is exactly the same as h zero over the stack of Higgs bundles. And there is a corresponding line bundle. So this h zero here is the stack, sorry, stack of G Higgs bundles. So this is just usual co-dimension argument. And then the next thing is that one has to prove a vanishing theorem, namely that the higher cohomology groups, and this is not true over the moduli space, and that's why the stack is really nifty for this. It is true over the stack that the higher cohomology groups are zero. Okay, 
And then it's a rather simple exercise to figure out that if you take the cohomology over the stack, because the stack almost by definition is sum of T star of uh, the stack of bundles, that this here is the same as n equals zero to infinity h star, and then s, where s is the stack of G bundles. And then the symmetric power, n symmetric power, so there should be an n here, n symmetric power, so this is kind of what I wrote for the, for the bundles, sorry, for the moduli spaces to begin with, but it's sort of more universally true when you work with the stack. And then finally, the stack of bundles when genus is bigger than one is very good. Uh, and so therefore there's no negative cohomology for that guy. And so therefore the index will be equal to, so the index over the stack, so the point is that the index T, well rather, let's put it this way. This becomes the index over the stack of bundles. Take the symmetric algebra of the tangent bundle of the stack and take L to the K. And so this becomes the, the index of that. And now you can compute the index using the Tillman Woodward index formula and it will give you the thing on the right. And that's why this guy is quirky like this because it's exactly the guy that is needed to give the characteristic classes of this guy over S in terms of a T about generators and so on. Okay. Great. Um, yes, let me just try to, uh, I wish I had a little bit of space on some blackboard. I guess I do have down here. I just want to show you a little a funny theorem, uh, which we also did uh, in pay, which namely looks at genus zero. So let's take genus equal to zero and let's take k bigger than twice the dual coxeter minus two. Then it turns out that, let's see what's the fastest way of writing it, that the index, so, so let, let me just, no, I write this again. The theorem says the following, that the sum, so this sum on the right, F regular rho comma T divided by the Weyl group of theta T of F, this is exactly P, so the Poincare polynomial of G evaluated at mi minus T. So for example, if you take G equals to SL to C, we know that the Poincare polynomial is one plus t to the third, so it minus, it becomes minus t3. So you see, it has no higher cohomologies because the no higher cohomologies actually holds for all g, not just genus higher than one, it holds for all g. So therefore, the only way that you can get a minus sign here is because there's negative cohomology. So that's the sort of signature of the fact that the stack is very derived in genus one and zero. But it's kind of a neat formula that it reproduces the Poincaré polynomial G by. Okay. Very good. Uh, any questions? While I do the boards. I guess it was too far out. So what I'm going to do now is the parabolic case. And the parabolic case is really important because the parabolic case is really going to give you another way of really analyzing this and understanding that everything actually assembles into a one plus one dimensional TQFT. But this you can only do if you do the parabolic case. Okay, so let's set that up. So parabolic case. Uh, 
Okay, so the label set will remain exactly the same as the usual conformal field theory label set. So it's the dominant positive weight for which you know that zero is less than or equal to the lambda in a product with theta less than or equal to k. So that's the usual label set from conformal field theory. I'm going to pick x1 up to xm, distinct points on sigma. Then I take p1 up to pm. These are all parabolic subgroups inside G. Then I take lambda 1 up to lambda m. These are all in the label set. And now you cannot just freely do this. You have to have the following condition that if you take the vial group for pi, then this must stabilize or must leave a lambda i invariant. So that's the constraint. Okay. Then we take pH. This is the moduli space of parabolic G Higgs bundles on C, of course, with respect to the data X, I, P, I, and lambda I. And now I take, actually, let me just introduce right away the stack corresponding to it. So I'm going to denote the stack like this. This is corresponding stack. And so let me, no, I wait with that, sorry. And then LK is the determinant line bundle uh, determined by this data. So by the data uh, like X, I, P, I, lambda. Okay, and now of course we can have a C star action and we are ready to do the same thing, that we can write H0 over the uh, moduli space of semi-stable bundles, and then L sub k, it's not necessarily a kth power, that's why I write it L sub k, and then the direct sum, n equals zero to infinity of the nth term in the transformation under the C star action, and then L k. So, like that. Yeah, I mean, I you know, look at Tillman and Woodward. So the, the one whose stack is roughly the, the cotangent number of the stack. Yes, yes, exactly. That's the one I want. So if I may leave it at that, then we can talk about it in the break because I need to finish in time. And then. But I mean, that's exactly it. And so, the, you know, you find it in Tillman and Woodward, their first paper together. Okay. Okay, so now the, the whole thing is we'd like to also compute the dimensions of these guys. Give a formula for it. So, um, yeah, first thing we do, of course, is to define the parabolic Hitchin character. And so that's simply the generating function of these guys. So actually, you know, we can discuss whether we want actually the stack or the moduli space. But for now, I'm just do, using it. I think the better definition will be the stack. But let me just, for now, in the talk here, give the, the moduli space definition. Like this, t to the n. Same thing again. And now the theorem is the following. And, uh, and this is just uh, us 
because uh, Daniel didn't do this thing. He didn't do the parabolic case. He did more general setup for uh, the, uh, the closed curve uh, case, where he doesn't assume uh, re reductive, and he looks at more general twisted uh, Higgs bundles and so on. And also, we have some twisting, but it, his is more general. And I'm only giving you with the trivial twisting, so the classical Higgs bundles. OK. But the formula says that the dimension of this guy here, LK, this is simply the same sum over the same set, no change there. And it's no change on the first factor at all, because this is sort of common to the Villinda formula, right? But then what you have to do is multiply on some characters. And this is the product of the following. Theta lambda i pi comma t of f. And so now I owe you this character. And the character is the following guy. So p, so it's for some element of, lamb, of the label set, a parabolic subgroup, and a t. And it's simply just sum over the vial group minus one to the L of W, and then you get E to the W lambda plus rho, divided by delta, and then pi running through the roots that are roots of G, but not roots of the parabolic subgroup. And then one minus T E to the W of alpha. So that's the guy. So this tells you how to you know, get the parabolic guys. You just multiply on like this. And this is complete parallel to, for example, the Valinda formula for SU2 with, in the non-Higgs bundle case, proved by two of the gentlemen in this audience here for the first time. So I guess 30 years ago or something like this, almost. OK. So I'd, let me just say that, 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 as I said, so R of, yeah, maybe it's this, OK. R of G mod P prime, this is the set of roots, subset of positive roots of the Lie algebra corresponding to root spaces which are not in the Lie algebra of the parabolic. So this is the Lie algebra of the Parabolic. Okay. Super. Now, you know, there is a completely different tool to try to attack these. So this is explicit formulas, except that, of course, it requires you to solve the equations. It requires, because notice that there is this little point here that says you just take the inverse image under that map. And over here, there is just take the inverse image under that map. And of course, this means solving the equations, just like you saw I wrote down equations for SL2C. So, yeah, it's explicit, but it's up to solving those equations. But what I will do now is show you TQFT rules, which gives you another tool to you know, understand these numbers, which is recursive and completely explicit, and doesn't need to solve any equations. Okay, so I'm going to define Let's see if this is a good place. Maybe I switch the, yeah, maybe. So let me define the following guy. D, G, comma, N, lambda, and this should be an M, by the way, M, of T. This is just the right-hand side of this formula. So I write it again, not to confuse it with the left hand. By the way, I forgot something here. G is bigger than one. Okay, so that's of course not satisfactory if we want a TQ of T because it's not enough to have G bigger than one, right? Okay, so let's uh, fix that. So I take F regular rho comma T divided by the vial group and I take theta T of F to the one minus G and then this product of the characters. So just the right hand side. Lambda I P I comma T of F product of I. So these guys here. Okay, and now the nice thing, maybe I can let that go now. <clears throat> so the nice thing about this 
is that, you know, that, that guy is really geometric. That quantity is not just the right-hand side of that formula, because it is actually true theorem that, uh, and this is Gukov and Pei and myself, that the index over the stack of parabolic bundles of ST of the tangent bundle to the stack, the lambda I, tensor L to the K, that this guy here is equal to D G comma M lambda vector of T. So the index over the stack is always given by this formula here. Because that's, the in, that's what comes out of some computations involving the parabolic case and then the index theorem application. Because the parabolic bundles fiber over the non-parabolic bundles in the stack situation. And so this is very nice because that's really telling you that this is the right gadget to consider actually. And it just so happens that it gives you a dimension formula for a vector space a graded dimension formula for a graded vector space in some cases, but it's the index over the stack one should really consider. Because now I will uh, uh, say the following. So let, let, um, let me start here and then I switch the board. So theorem, and it's the same guys again, uh, and pay, which says that now I'm gonna, I'm gonna take all the BIs to be Borel's. So I only consider the PIs to be Borel's. Okay, that allows all labels from the label set. So what it says is the following in words, D, G, N of lambda of T, or actually just yeah, T, uh, is a one plus one dimensional TQFT. So I could stop there. I've said everything I need to say. But let me just remind you, what does this mean? It means the following two sets of recursion relations. If you consider genus G plus one, N minus two points, and you consider lambda, then that function is the same as summing through the label set G, G, N, lambda vector, lambda, lambda star, and then D lambda. And D lambda is a little bit special and new in this game because in the old factorization rules, D lambda would be one. There's no weight. Let me describe what D lambda is below and finish the other recursion relation. The other recursion relation is where I split the genus in two. So, you know, D, DG1 plus G2 comma N1 plus N2 of lambda uh, one vector comma lambda two vector uh, is given by summing lambda in the label set GG1 N1 plus one lambda one vector comma lambda D2 N2 plus one lambda two vector comma lambda star, and then again this d lambda. So do I have to make the draw usual drawings of the surfaces, or can you imagine that I'm, in the first one I'm shrinking a cycle, which is uh, uh, non-separating, and the last one I'm shrinking a cycle on the surface that's separating. That's what these two recursion relations uh, sort of underlies in the curve. And what is d lambda? D lambda is nothing but the Poincaré polynomial of the classifying space of H lambda at T to the one half, where H lambda is the stabilizer of E to the two pi I, the covector divided by K exponentiated in K, where K is the compact form of G, compact form, And lambda check is just what you think it is. It will stick in lambda in the first uh, of the pairing of the killing form. 
So it's an element in K, and you look at the stabilizer in K, and then you take, so that's a compact group, and you take B of that, and you take P, the Poincaré polynomial of that, a T to uh, one half. Okay, so now you can say, okay, there is a general theorem by Vladimir Tureyev that says that one plus one dimensional T Q of T's are in one to one correspondence with Frobenius algebras, uh, commutative Frobenius algebras. And so, what is the commutative Frobenius algebra in this case here? In other words, what is the Velinda algebra? Well, let me write down that. And so I, I should say that these recursion relations are actually non-trivial to prove. I mean, it took us considerable efforts to actually do that. These are hard. Because they nail completely what uh, theory you have. Once you have those rules, you just need the Velinda algebra and you can run everything. You can compute all numbers. So the complex Velinda algebra Surprisingly enough, of course, or not at all, right, it's going to be a T deformation of the usual guy. And so the vector space is going to be actually totally unchanged. It's just the free C vector space on the label set, lambda k. So it's a finite dimensional vector space. It's exactly the same as the usual Velinda algebra's underlying vector space. But the product is deformed. So lambda star t mu, this is the sum over nu in the label set. Then you take d zero of three, lambda mu nu star, and then you take t, and then you do d nu of t, and then you do nu. So this is the product. So the product knows about the three-point function in physics language. And so you need to know the three-point function to determine the Velinda algebra. And then you need one more thing, because you also need an inner product. And the inner product is simply the following. So that's given totally explicit. Delta mu star d lambda of t inverse, where d lambda is the guy from over there. And so the theorem is the following. And so commutativity here really is the first recursion up to zero four. And so it's, it's non-trivial to really prove that this is a, a commutative for being algebra, defined this way. And we'd like to know a stack proof of that. But uh, we have friends in uh, the Lee community, and so they come in very helpful and handy. But so uh, theorem, And uh, so this is the same with some uh, severe help from, uh, so I write it here in parentheses, Janssen. And so the, it says the triple, actually I could have added his name also to these recursion relations, but okay, it's no. triple GK XT. Like this, actually if you ask him if that's what he did, he says, I have no idea what you're talking about, but he has proved a very, very specific combinatorial relation for us in Lie theory, and that we use. So it says that this is a Frobenius algebra, commutative algebra, so a commutative Frobenius algebra for small t. In fact, the whole thing is totally analytic in T if T is just in a small neighborhood of zero. Okay, and so what this here is saying is that this Velinda algebra here, this complex Velinda algebra for G, and its inner product here, this is completely equivalent information to all of these D, G, N, uh, lambda vector of T. So these two are one to one. This is the Tureyev classification. So, 
That's sort of a, a theorem that completely combinatorially controls all of these numbers. And let me now just try to finish by actually showing you what is this explicitly for SL2C. So I'm going to try to do that here. Sorry. So I will now try to give you the product and, um, and the inner product. And I'll, of course, also give you the vector space. But the vector space is like the one you know, right? It's just the vector space, the dimension k plus 1. So uh, it has, you know, standard generators, just the integers from, uh, let's see what we chose. Yeah, from 0 to k. So example, g is equal to SL to c. So lambda is the vector is zero up to k. So you know v k g in this case here is therefore the rec sum of c and then some uh, i here where i runs from zero to k. So it's just k plus one dimensional space. And now the inner product is the following guy. It's diagonal in the way that the basis I've chosen. And then it gives you the following. It gives you 1 minus t squared with lambda is 0. So I guess I want to write lambda equals 0 and lambda to be consistent with what I've done before. 1 minus t when lambda is 1. And that continues down to 1 minus t when lambda is k minus 1. And then 1 minus t squared when lambda is k. So that's not complicated, right? That's explicit. And the next thing is going to be equally explicit. So um, I'm going to de define a product by writing it for you like this. So I'm just going to define coefficients lambda mu nu like this. And then I'm going to give you explicit formula for these guys. So f of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, it turns out to be simpler to write it like this. It is 1 if lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is even, and delta lambda, which I'm going to define in a second, is less than or equal to 0. It is t to the delta lambda half if this guy is still even and delta lambda is bigger than 0. And it's 0 if lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is odd. And here's delta lambda. Delta lambda is the max of four integers, uh, d0, d1, d2, and d3. And d0 is the sum of the lambdas, minus 2k. And d1 is lambda 1 minus the rest of them. Lambda or d2 is lambda 2 minus the rest of them. And d3 is lambda 3 minus the rest of them. So that's totally explicit. Now you can go away and compute these dimension formulas to any g and n you like by just iterating using the gluing rules. So. Uh, let me just end by saying that there is a kind of starting understanding of these spaces in terms of something like conformal blocks. But because the whole thing is derived and so on, you know, it's really going to stay in the derived language when you want to write down what the space of conformal blocks is. But there is actually an understanding of this in terms of flag varieties and in terms of highest weight modules of Lie, Lie loop groups. Um, I don't think we have quite as good an understanding as we want yet, but things are progressing. Now, finally, I would like to add that you might think that I have, I have t-deformed the Valinda algebra, I've t-deformed the gluing rules, and I've t-deformed 
the actual Relinda formula. So you might think, well, Relinda algebra just gives me the vector space of two plus, of dimension of the vector space of two plus one dimensional TQFTs. So maybe the whole ratio T into ray of TQFTs T deforms also. Yes, that's probably the case, but if you look at these bundles over moduli space of curves as graded bundles, then there are severe obstructions for that bundle to have a graded projectively flat connection because the graded pieces have non-trivial higher churn classes over the moduli space. So probably the theory is not a graded theory at all. It needs all powers of T in one go because there is a construction of objective flat connection in another quantization. So a quantization with respect to a real polarization on the Higgs bundle moduli space due to Witten. And most likely this direct sum is isomorphic to that space, but not in any graded way. And so you will get a projectively flat connection on this infinite dimensional, or infinite rank bundle, but it doesn't respect the grading in, in a nice way, I think. It's impossible because it has churn classes. So, thank you very much. Are there any questions? You said it's analytic in T small. Yeah. So what's, the radius of, what's the radius of convergence? Or do you know anything where are the singularities and their meaning? I don't think we know at this point. So we just know, we can just prove that for, you know, small perturbations, you won't change the size of the set by some nice arguments, actually. Uh, and so then, may, maybe it continues up to one, I'm not sure, but uh, it, it's, so far we've just been happy to have this one parameter family in analytic in T, which gives us this sequence of Valenda algebra that determines everything. But, uh, it is right that we need to now study how does that behave when T grows large, and what kind of behavior does it have, blah, blah, blah. Good question, but we don't know. Any other questions? If not, let's start the video.